I remember thinking, wool is bad, leather is bad, but then learning about all the chemicals, it's almost like food. Look, if you're eating a whole food vegan diet, great. But all the chemicals that were going into making the fake meat and making the fake food, it was affecting my body. It's kind of like in fashion. What goes into making these fake leathers and fake furs? Like how many chemicals are the people that are working exposed to? How is it affecting the environment? Is it breaking down? It's always like going back to the basics. The climate conversation has never been more divided. As disruptors in this space, we're hungry to find solutions to the challenges our environment faces. Welcome to the Climate Rebels Podcast. My name is Joel Caesar. I'm joined by Owen Barrett and Chris Pomerleau. We are experts in clean energy, net zero real estate, decarbonization, and entrepreneurship. We celebrate those who take action against the climate crisis and are striving to make the world a cleaner place. Thanks for joining the conversation. Now, let's get to work. Mona Van. Welcome to the Climate Rebels podcast. Thank you. We like to get right to work. We ask all our guests the same question to start the show. How are you a climate rebel? I think I do a lot of little things and they just keep adding up. The more you get used to it, the slower the burn is in a good way, right? Because it's like, I'm so, so conscious of recycling. Even like, obviously there's plastic and non-plastic, but now it's like, oh, if there's food left in the plastic, I'll empty it out, rinse it out and make sure I recycle it. I've even started doing this Rent the Runway. Yeah, of course. So, you know, I'm doing so many video shoots and stuff and I'm like, instead of buying new clothes all the time, why don't I just rent and swap it out? So that's one thing I've been doing. I mean, no plastic. Like I've swapped out all plastic in my house. I always have my reusable, I'm drinking one right now, my reusable cup for matcha. And those are a few things. And I've really gotten into sustainable clothing lately. I look forward to diving deep into clothing, deep into food. I know a lot of things resonate around sustainability with you, but love to start off with your journey to where you are now. I know you've pharmacist background. Mm -hmm. You're now a public figure. How was that transition? You know, it seems someone who's a fan of yours, it comes natural. It seems like you're born for it. I think I always wanted to be on camera and I liked media and TV. Like I've shared this before. I wanted to be a news anchor when I was young. That was like my dream job. But coming from Persian background, my parents were really big on education. And it was like pharmacist made sense. Good job for women. You know, you can work four days a week. And when I was studying pharmacy school, I really liked learning about the body and health. I was into it. But then my last year of pharmacy school, I started getting into health and wellness more. I joined a gym. The school load was a little less. It was more like rotations. So I started getting into it. And then when I moved to LA, it was really the work field that was horrible for me. So the transition was long and slow. I always like to share that because I think so many people think there's like the overnight, like you go viral and then that's it. Yeah. I realized I wasn't happy doing what I was doing. And I also realized that I didn't like the field that I was in, in terms of pharmacies telling me I had to push flu vaccines and I had to give 10 a day to meet their quota and people didn't really care what they were eating or doing lifestyle wise. They were just like getting their diabetes medication while they were buying bags of chips. So I knew it really wasn't what I wanted to do, but I took hosting classes. I started building an online presence and I was doing both at the same time until after a few years I could transition. So maybe it felt like a slow transition versus something that was that sudden. Yeah. I'm doing this podcast. Am I a public figure? Not yet, but I work full time at Google and I lead the building decarbonization program there. Something I'm really proud of. It's important, but I'm starting a company on the side. And then we thought this podcast was a way to get our voice out further. And I met Gary actually when we started working with the Sasha group here and had that question, like, what's your advice for someone who's struggling with becoming a public figure, getting their voice out there, doing a podcast? He had great advice to say, do you care about what you're doing with your career? And for me, saving the planet, sustainability, climate. I said, of course, yeah, mm -hmm. that's why I do what I do. Then he said, you need to get your voice out there then. If you, it matters to you and you think you have something to say, then it's almost an obligation. So it's interesting to think about those of us who feel we have something to say and then transitioning into the public figure. Role. That brings up such a good point because I think it's all like connected, right? You get into health and wellness. It's a natural transition into eating more clean and natural, and then you're more sustainable. And then you're like, oh, mindfulness actually matters. And then you start meditating. So it's like this transition into this world yeah. where it's all connected. And the deeper I've gone into that, you feel more purpose driven in your work versus less ego. And some of the things I share about food, I'm like, people need to know this. That's really how I feel. I'm like, they have to know like things I'm working on now. I'm like, this is really going to help people. Yeah. So I get that. The food part too. We'll, we'll talk more about it. Mm -hmm. Anyone who works in sustainability, their journey ultimately comes to food. Um, so it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. They both lead to each other. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, lots of people view your content for health, wellness, beauty, fashion. This is a 
climate podcast, sustainability. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about how you view your world, health, wellness through the lens of sustainability? You touched on a little bit so far, but maybe talk about that journey, how you got there. Yeah, you know, I think first the health food stuff, I would say was a little more vain. And it was like, I want to look good. I want to look young forever. And like, that's a lot of, I would say also the LA mentality in terms of like fitness and eating well and working out. Also, as you get a little bit older, I'm like, I just want to feel really good. Mm -hmm. I want to always feel good. And as the mindfulness part really crept in, you just learn about how everything you do impacts everyone around you and how real karma is. Even if you want to look at it selfishly, like you want to manifest things, like the more good you put out and the better energy you put out, the more will come to you. It's funny, the fashion thing was so just serendipitous. I was like really into fashion and I actually was like, this is a real passion. This isn't just like something I'm doing for ego. I really like it. I started working with a stylist and coincidentally, she's extremely passionate on sustainable clothing. So the last year working with her, Caroline Spenning, she's taught me so much and really opened my eyes even to like, I used to think vegan everything was better But then it was like, oh, actually using wool and using natural materials and things that are reused. So she's really opened my eyes and taught me a lot. And that's really how that transition went into fashion. But again, they're all connected. Yeah. And things that last too. Things that last and even like not exposing yourself to chemicals, even in your clothing. Yeah. You know, if you're like sweating and wearing your clothing and breathing it in and there's like artificial dyes and polyester, like that's all, you know. It's interesting, the question of public figure, vanity food as well. Mm -hmm. I've found myself in the few months recently of preparing for this podcast, being ready to be on camera, being very cognizant. It helps me make better decisions. Yeah. I want my skin to be better. I want less inflammation, right? I think it's okay. I mean, I'm always like, we are human at the end of the day. There's nothing wrong with wanting to look and feel your best. It's just, that's not all it is. And I think a lot of times that's the only thing people focus on, but the deeper you go, the more It has more meaning. You often are sharing tips for people in their personal life to do better, to live more sustainably, more consciously. You sometimes promote products. I'm curious, that must be hard. Once you start to be someone who is saying, this is who I am, I want to help others be the same. I'm open to sharing products if I use them and believe in them, but you must be bombarded. How do you vet? The ones oh, that with are products? legit? Yeah. With products, especially the amount of chemicals I look for, it's actually exhausting. <laughs> and a lot of times before anyone even sends me in terms of food, food is easy. There's not that many ingredients, so I can say no quickly. Skincare products, household products, like first we have like a list of things like, is it free of X, Y, Z? And then even after that, we have to vet. I mean, I have piles in a closet that I store because I'm not going to use them unless I know they're clean. Mm. And my thing is like, why would I? I almost like put it back on the brand. Like if you can tell me that you're free of this, this, and this, if you're looking up all your ingredients and they're EWG2 or lower, then I'm willing to try it. You said exhausting. Yeah, it, it is. It is exhausting to be an environmentalist sometimes. I uh, I just moved from California, from Santa Cruz to New York. The moving process. So many things I was doing to donate, to sell, to make sure my waste that mm. we were getting rid of was going to the right place. Oftentimes I'd talk to family or friends about it and they would be like, why are you making this so hard? And once you realize the impact you're having and the right way to do things, it is a burden on some of us, but I'm sure you're going to say, right? That's a burden that once you learn of the impact, it's hard to dismiss. It's almost like when people say waking up early to have a productive day, right? There's like the pain of waking up early. There's the pain of pushing yourself, but the pain of not doing it and feeling bad about yourself is worse. Mm. So it's almost like, yes, maybe it's a little burden, but the karma you're putting out in the world and the more good that's going to come to you is worth it. Yeah. I mean, I would say food shopping is similar. I mean, you said it's easier, right? You look for simple ingredients, but you're not just going and grabbing based no, on price but what, or based on- But after a minute, you know the brands you like and you stick to what you like. I don't ever want it to be stressful. And I think there's a fine line where you care so much about this cause or this thing that you can get obsessive. So I really work on not doing that and knowing like if my intention is right, Like, you know, when I'm out to eat, I'm not going to stress over what, you know, I don't know what salt they used or what you just have to let go. But I'm like in the things that I'm doing every day at home, what I can be in control of, I like to be very conscious of. Well, we're in the food. Let's let's go there. Okay. I've studied sustainability. I come at it from buildings mainly. I was an environmentalist and then I got into real estate and buildings because that's a huge footprint on the environment. Can I just ask what is an environmentalist technically or is it a broad term? I would say it's broad. Okay. I would say you and I are environmentalists. Okay. People so who care. Got it. 
can we that use that definition? It's probably a I'm, more Yes, deeper. I'm an environmentalist too then. Yes, okay. I know you are. Okay. But when it comes to the environment, so you can think, how do I want to save the planet in my career or what I do with my professional life? And I've chose buildings. It's a huge footprint. Buildings account for 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Oh, wow. But then it's food and then it's clothing. So it's mm -hmm. shelter, food, clothing. These are the things that are foundations of our lives. What does it mean to be sustainable? We're trying to figure out a way to thrive as a society without negatively impacting ecosystems. So like I mentioned earlier, I didn't come at this from food, but you know, I think sustainability ultimately comes to food. That message is real. I'd love to hear from you. Food was part of your life, part of your culture, part of your passion. And then it became sustainability with food? Mm -hmm. Yes, they all just tie into consciousness, I think. I'm so conscious of everything I do now, like every thought I have, every word I speak, how I'm impacting the environment. And I think it doesn't necessarily matter which path it comes from. Like you could have started with sustainability and then got into food. Even when it comes to, I cannot throw anything out. Like I never used to be like that. I would say in the last three or four years, it's like, I will offer it to anyone. Do you want these 15 crackers? Like I'll put them in a baggie. I just, I feel wrong doing it when there's just so much waste. So I'd say in food, that's a big part of it. I love buying local. Mm -hmm. I also probably I'm more on the health end of that where I'm like the less it travels, the more nutrients it yeah. has, but it's also just better for the planet in general. Well, we talked about this a little bit off camera here. I just moved from California. I'm a New Yorker now. And <laughs> you're, um, tr you're struggling. <laughs> well, I'm trying to be optimistic, but I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to an expert. So I'd love to know, you know, one of the things Google has a famous food program. I'm in a group called Real Estate and Workplace Services at Google and food is a big part of what we do for the staff at Google. And one of the core tenants we say is local, seasonal, colorful. Hmm. It's like, you know, you can think broadly about how to eat, but if you focus on those three simple things and you probably be all right for health and the planet, help me. What do we, what do we do in New York? I started researching some farms a couple of years ago and there are, I mean, look, we're in New York city, but you leave for 45 minutes and you're, you're in the suburbs again. So there are farms that have these delivery services where you get like a weekly box of what's in season. And of course it's different in terms of like our weather here, our climate and what we have in season, but they are very cool. There's somewhere you can order like exactly what you want. There's some that just have like the box that comes to you. I even thought of it as a really cool practice to just stop needing and wanting so much and just kind of flow with nature. Mm. Like, you know, I'm like, I have to have blueberries every morning. I love blueberries, but maybe like eat them when they're in season and try other things. It also helped me experiment with foods that I didn't even know of that existed. Unfortunately, it's not LA. California, <laughs> I miss the Melrose Place Farmer's Market. It's hard. It's yeah. just a different climate, but you get used to it. New York has so many other things that are charming. We'll be hopeful about this, but I would say, I guess I will tell a little bit about my food journey because I think there's a lesson maybe you can take I'm from I'm interested it. too. I grew up in Pennsylvania, a suburb. I was one of three boys, very busy working parents. And I would say growing up, a lot of my dinners were, here's 20 bucks, go get Burger King and Pizza Hut. And I love that growing up. And it was like, I listened to your podcast recently with Deepak, where he talked about how we're conditioned culturally, ancestrally, and that's why the food I liked. But then I came to California because I love the ocean. I wanted to surf. I ended up going to grad school at this school called the Bren School of Environmental Science and Management at UC Santa Barbara. My roommate there, we lived in this little house that had a chicken coop, the landlord did. In that property, they had an avocado tree. They had, <sighs> they had a herb, herbal garden. And my it's roommate was this young woman who grew up in LA, hippie parents of Venice Beach. So she was the opposite of me. And she just slowly introduced me to gardening and to going out to the garden and taking food to help us cook with. And it was transformational for me, just mm. that piece of, I can go out and help tend the land and use that as my food, as my nourishment. And it changed my life. I've never been the same, just connecting wow. with that food. And that's why even I say now I'm struggling coming back to the East Coast. Am I going to be able to find that? Since that point, and that was 15 years ago, I've always gardened. I've always tried to make sure like, what can I do in season and bring that to my plate? So I'd say that it's a positive story for me, that there's a way people can unlock those conditions and get to a better place with food. How does everyone find that way, even if they're not in Santa Barbara or LA? Even just what you said, how you were connected to the food. I feel that way now, even just by using fresh herbs, cooking at home. It's funny because some people are like, oh, well, you can afford it. I'm like, it's actually less expensive. It's easier and more expensive. Just go out and grab a coffee or find a place with an organic salad. But there's something about buying fresh herbs and fresh produce and preparing it at home. Like that process 
when you connect to it makes you feel so good. I don't even know how to explain it. Cause I'm like, I don't know why it makes me feel good. It just does. So true. When you were saying it, I'm like, I know the exact feeling I'm craving it too. Yeah. Maybe you could go visit some of these farms. They're not that far away. I want to really see where my food comes from. And I share that a lot. Sometimes people like to attack and say like, oh my God, that's so obsessive. Like just relax. And I'm like, why is it obsessive to really pay attention to what's going into your body? Like, especially if it's something you're going to be consuming all the time, make it a smart choice, a conscious choice, like go see the farms that it's grown on, just be more connected to it. And I feel like it gives you more of an appreciation. So I think cooking at home and incorporating a lot of fresh herbs will be really grounding for you. Yeah. People plan at profit. Mm -hmm. Knowing your farm, seeing if the people that work there are treated fairly mm -hmm. is also part of this journey, right? Yeah. It's not just about our health or the impact on the environment of where that food's grown, but the people who are responsible for bringing it to us and ensuring that their lives are free and they can thrive is another great reason to visit farms, I'm sure well, you what agree. about What about the energy that they're omitting when they're farming or planting? All yeah. of that is connected. I'm sure you know of some of the companies online, there's pasture something, there's grassland beef, there's these places where you know they order from like sustainable farms and it's 100% grass fed, even just making choices like that versus just like running to the grocery store to buy your burger. You've experimented with different diet philosophies, mm -hmm. fair to say. Maybe All just talk about that journey and where you landed and maybe how that fits into the impact on the environment as well. Yeah, I started eating everything as a kid. And then when I moved to LA, I think I was socially influenced where it was like, oh, red meat, like, no, I'm not gonna eat red meat anymore. And then I've stopped eating dairy. And then I was really learning a lot about veganism. And so it was kind of an easy transition for me. The only things I was really eating were like fish and cheese, which I always say the last things people give up. Then I was vegan for like almost seven years. And I loved it. I actually had no like issues missing anything. Like I feel like LA has a lot of great options. Yeah. I did start experiencing gut health issues after a certain point. And so after trying all the easy, quick fix, Western medicine techniques that didn't work, I started seeing functional medicine doctors. They were like, okay, well, you're eating a lot of legumes and grains. Why don't we add back a little fish? And then they were like, your iron's really low. Why don't we add back a little grass fed beef? So I slowly started adding things back. And even from there, I've experimented with like low FODMAP, paleo, keto, candida diet. It. But where I've gotten to now, I just feel the best, honestly. And it's really just eating clean, sustainable, organic. Right now, I've just landed on if I'm eating animal protein, I know where it's coming from. I'm making sure it's grass fed, it's sustainable, it's humanely raised, buying local as much as I can, and really just eating simple, yeah, clean, like very, I mean, minimally, minimally processed. It's complicated too with the environmental aspect of it. If you look at a carbon emission metric, breakdown of what to eat. Beef is really high. Beef is bad for carbon emissions. But I think there's more and more resource, more and more data indicating if it's sourced properly, if it's farmed properly, if we all were conscious about beef in a better way, then the carbon emissions could be alleviated. So I think it's important for us to remind everyone there's no perfect recipe out there for everybody. Environmentally, like what is the best way to eat? I've also seen mixed reviews. There's like so many studies on both sides. So is it like beef is the worst thing we should avoid it or it's, is it not uh, I, black I, and white? Like I won't claim things? to be an expert, so I don't want to go over my skis. But if you think climate change is the biggest existential crisis the planet faces, which I do, we do at this podcast, then beef is the worst offender. But as I said, I think that's nuanced because of the way currently we source beef around the world right now. And would lamb be better or would lamb's bison be better? Lamb's probably second worst. Okay. But bison's better. Bison's better. Because it's, you know, more naturally occurring. Arguably. That's, see, that's like just people with lack of education. We're always learning more and more. Totally. Well, food wise, you have a business. I partnered with the business Daily Dose. I actually discovered them probably three years ago. They had a prepared food thing and I tried their chia pudding and I was like, who is this company? It was the best chia pudding I'd ever had. And I reached out to the founder, just like, can I get your recipe? I put it on my website. So we were just kind of friendly and they do a lot of collaborations with people in the health and wellness space. So she brought up, do you want to do a meal plan together? And she actually wanted me to lead their fully vegan meal plan, but I had just like stopped being vegan. So I was like, why don't we have it start as vegan? There's also an omnivore option. So that's what it is. It's extremely clean. Everything's sustainable, organic, grass fed and finished, local, even the packaging, the environmental packaging is so interesting. They use like corn and plants, like to even make the plastic lid, everything's that compostable. Yeah, so, yeah, so it's just so cool. 
The technology is so cool. I'm like, who came up with this? I yeah. don't, it's amazing. So it's just like an all around, like great, great meal plan. Like you feel good about what you're doing for the world. You feel good about what you're putting into your body. It tastes good. It's really interesting. I years ago experimented with Blue Apron. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction when I got it was, look at all this plastic. There's got to be a better way to do this. And I was like, I can't. This is going to be the plastic every time. I can't do this. Right. E even Daily Dose, some people, when I shared it, were like, how come all the plastic packaging? And I'm like, no, 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 go to the website. Bio-based. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. great. Which I'm even still learning about. I'm so confused. Like, is it technically plastic if it's bio-based? It's a big challenge for Google. We try to be zero waste, mm -hmm. but there is packaging. There's lots of cool companies experimenting with bio-based materials. But if we throw them in our compost bin that goes to the municipally managed composting system, that's not meant for these bio-based plastics, which mm. will break down. And they're able to call themselves bio-based because they do but not at the rate food waste would in a compost pile. So it's great that you're out here promoting and making sure that in what you do put your name behind, it's not petroleum based plastic that we know won't break down. No, definitely not. I'm very, very careful. I'm not saying like everything has to be perfect, but if I am putting my name behind it, I want to feel really good about every aspect of it. Well, that's a good segue to another area. So we talked shelter, food, now clothing. Mm -hmm. Have you been surprised by the environmental impact of fashion and how have you coped with that and how is that changing the way you speak about it and who you partner with? My eyes were really open because just textile, just even making clothing can be so taxing on the environment. So it's a big learning process. I also like to give myself grace as I'm learning, you know, and I think I'm buying much more thoughtfully. There's so many brands out there that are so inexpensive. It's fast fashion. Mm -hmm. And it used to seem like the best thing ever. And you were just oh, constantly getting new things. Like I'm so conscious of what I buy. And when I buy something, it tends to be more expensive, but I'm like, this is a forever piece. I also even pay attention to when I am buying something, I try to get like timeless looks which is a little more my style anyway, but I'm like, it's not like some crazy fad that I might not ever want to wear again in a year. Mm. It's a pretty similar style and using more natural materials. Like again, I remember thinking wool is bad, leather is bad, but then learning about all the chemicals that it's almost like food. Look, if you're eating a whole food vegan diet, like great, but all the chemicals that were going into making the fake meat and making the fake food, it was affecting my body. It's kind of like in fashion, what goes into making these fake leathers and fake furs? Like how many chemicals are the people that are working exposed to? How is it affecting the environment? Is it breaking down? It's always like going back to the basics, almost yeah. like paleo, right? You're like, okay, the most natural materials, even my mattress, I want to swap out now. Or I'm like, what am I sleeping on and inhaling all the time? And like really just having everything be as natural as possible. It goes back to kind of being exhausted as an environmentalist, but you start to think, what is everything made of? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like your clothes, your shampoo that you're breathing every day, you just think about it all. And you also just think about the impact it has on the environment. You can come back to beef too, because there's all these new fake meat companies. Yes. I don't know how you feel about all of them, but some of them have a long list of hard to pronounce compounds. Yep. Is it maybe grass fed beef? Just okay. Exactly. I used to share them all the time with recipes. I didn't know, you know, we're human and we evolve and we learn. I thought vegan was always just better. Mm -hmm. And then they also sometimes can trick you when it's like soy free and gluten free. You're like, great. Oh, wait, but it has cornstarch and canola oil, which are really bad for you. So it's just being mindful. And I think when it gets overwhelming, if you just bring it back to going as simple and natural as possible, it makes it a lot easier. So true. And on the fashion piece, I also want to expand upon the, the idea of timelessness and quality. My wife, my partner, she works in fashion. She, she years ago worked at Diesel and Diesel jeans can be expensive, mm -hmm. but she pointed out they're handmade in Italy. They're high quality. They're sourced from the best cotton in the world and they'll last. And she's been right. You can wear a pair of Diesel jeans for 20 years. My mom is so immigrant vibes. Like she doesn't want to spend a lot of money on herself, like everything she wants to like give to her kids. And she'll buy like a new pair of jeans, like multiple times a year that are so inexpensive. I'm like, mom, we're going to buy you one pair of really nice jeans and you're going to keep these for a few years because first of all, she's ending up wasting more money over the years. She's not realizing. Mm. And it's just more wasteful for the environment. Yeah. It sounds like an ad for Rent the Runway, but any kind of service like that, I find so cool, especially in the world we're in now where we're sharing a lot of photos and you might not, I mean, although I think there's nothing wrong with posting the same looks, but if you don't want to, they can swap things out and I don't have to keep them. Yeah. If you're going to invest in something that like a really great wool sweater, it's like every winter, you know, you're going to use it, you know, it's a pretty classic look, but I think investing in quality pieces and 
avoiding polyester, like sticking to 100% cotton or wool is just more quality. Yeah, and that comes back to the idea of the plastics. What's going to break down in the environment if it does find its way to a landfill? The wool, the natural materials that can break down. That's what the planet was mm -hmm. been doing for a long time. And if you do have pieces that aren't now, like, like give them to your family, to friends, give them to shelters. Like don't throw things out. There's nothing I throw out. All my clothes goes to like my cousins in Iran or my my mom's friend's daughter or I'll donate it to shelters, like anything. Just stop throwing everything out. That's great advice. Let's transition a bit to entrepreneurship. You at this point are wearing many hats. You talked about your dream as a kid of being a news anchor. Mm -hmm. Where did entrepreneurship come? Has that come later in life? Do you find it natural? What's inspiring you about that part of your life right now? It actually does not come natural to me, just to be totally honest. I am way more creative than I gave myself credit for when I was in pharmacy school. And that was what I missed the most was having a new project to work on or something to work towards. Because like working towards a goal, I feel like gives you purpose. And in school, I was always working towards graduation. And then when I got into the system where it was like, this is it for life. Like you'll get a week vacation and maybe another one in four years. I, I was like, oh no, 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 this isn't gonna be my life. So I like the idea of being creative and having the option to do different things. I will say like managing people and running a business is not something I personally enjoy. I always felt like creative directing, having partners, being able to delegate, which is probably why it took me a while to build too, because once I could afford it and I was making money, then I could have a team around me. Whereas like me sitting and like editing videos, I was never going to be able to do. I just mm -hmm. know myself. So it's good to also be self-aware of where your skills are. Yeah. I would ask personally advice here, wearing multiple hats, you know, I think it's common these days, right? A lot of mm -hmm. us are doing many things and that's awesome. But any advice on how you manage the various things you're doing at all times? I really focus on joy in which things I'm actually passionate about because I think it's really easy to get sucked into the like, I should be doing something next. Like what's my next thing I'm going to do, especially in like the creator world that I'm in, you know, like we all end up meeting each other and talking and like, oh, so-and-so started a product or so-and-so is coming out with a makeup line or starting this business. And you almost feel like you have to do something because it's the next step and just taking a step back and being on your own journey mm -hmm. and doing what comes more natural to you. If I start a product, do I want to be in an office every day because that's really running a business? I'm like, no, I would just be doing it because I want to say I'm doing something. So going slow and being patient has been really important to me and just you know, focusing on the things that really bring me joy. Like I had a YouTube channel for years. I don't like it anymore. So I stopped doing it. I'm focusing on other things. Hmm. It's good advice. Even this conversation, the podcast starting, I love asking provocative questions about the environment. Mm -hmm. It's what I do in my jobs. It's part of what I think has given me success in my core career in green building and real estate. And so starting a podcast like this, I was looking forward to this conversation. Yeah. I was, I, I'm curious and I want to ask provocative questions. So it's, it is good advice to follow your joy. Follow your joy. I, I always think about too, what would I be doing if I didn't need any money and I was doing it for free? Like, what would I do anyway? And I'm like, I would experiment with recipes. I would like one project I'm working on. I would want to do this anyway. It's a passion project. It's a really blessed place to be in where you can make that your work. Yeah. We started this podcast and one of our goals was it for it to be approachable. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of climate and sustainability content out there that's wonky in the weeds, slow, boring, and hard to comprehend. We wanted to be different. It's like very factual. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to to meet with people like yourself and other leaders, the doers, the people taking action, the disruptors, let's celebrate, let's be optimistic. The company I'm starting, we're trying to bring lots of people to invest in sustainable real estate. That's one of the goals of my company, Raven, that's behind this podcast. And we're often asking ourselves, how do we reach a bigger audience? Not just the people who you can have a Google ads approach that says, if someone's out there searching for climate, we can target them. But we wanna bring an audience that's wider. I think finding a way to connect to people is huge. Because like, even to be honest, a few years ago and people are like, it's good for the environment. Like it wasn't clicking for me. I wasn't able to realize how important it was or care. And there's so many people who care about manifestation or who are like, I want to manifest things in my life. And like knowing, hey, did you know that the better you are to your environment, the more good will come back to you. Or maybe it's like on sustainable clothing or fashion, or do you know that eating sustainably is actually healthier for you? So maybe finding angles that really connects. Everyone has their own passion and need and desire. So it'll hit them in a different way. Yeah, that's great advice. Well, I'm going to ask a similar question, but it's how we like to wrap all of our interviews. Again, I said there's a lot of negativity around climate and 
I think it's important that we highlight the challenges that the planet faces if we don't change course. But again, we want a message that's about optimism and mm-hmm. the future. So if we can ask you, what gives you hope about the future? I think that in general, people are moving to a more conscious place. I think the conversation's just so much more common now. I also just on a more literal scale, I think the creativity behind like how to use plastic and reuse it for different things blows my mind. I mean, this one shoe brand, Rothy's, it's like their shoelaces are made from plastic. I mean, they're all their shoes and they use like banana and pineapple. I'm like, who came up with this? It's so interesting and creative. So I think that really inspires me because I'm like so many brands are moving into that direction. So I think I think it's almost becoming unacceptable to not, which is good yeah. as we should care. I think that's true. Even in my world of buildings and real estate, I get so many messages from innovators with products that are going to change the world. So that gives me hope too. I have a family member who created their house they built eight years ago or 10 years ago is like a fully greenhouse. Everything like though it's like solar energy and like, I mean, they built it from bottom up and I remember being like, what are you talking about? Cause her and her husband are really into it. And yeah. it's so cool to look at now. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. Same here. How can our audience find you? How can we plug? Um, you can just find me at Mona Vand on Instagram, TikTok, and my website is monavand.com. Awesome. Thank you, Mona, so much for joining Thank us. Thank you.